Our next speaker is Katie Roberts. And Katie is Data Science Solutions Architect at Neo4j. She's formerly from Tamer. And uh, she happens to have a PhD in Cognitive Neuroscience from Harvard. Y'all, can we just take a minute and give just a, an applause for some of the speakers that we've had today? Every time I, every time I introduce someone, I'm, I'm sort of in awe over their accomplishments. <laughs> Welcome, Katie Roberts. Thanks, Beverly. Thanks, Mom. All right. Um, I am going to jump on the bandwagon and start off with some uh, hand-raising questions. So just to get a feel for the room, um, can you raise your hand if you are familiar with graph data science? All right, cool. We've got some, some members of the audience. Volume up. Volume up. OK. Do I have control over that? We're working on it. Oh. Give us a test now, Katie. Hello? Is that better? Oops. All right, great. Well, that answers two questions. Who has good hearing and who also knows about graph data science? Um, now, raise your hand if you've experienced a targeted recommendation in the past few days. <laughs> All right. And now, let's also raise your hand if you've experienced a recommendation before that kind of annoyed you because it really wasn't relevant to your life. Yeah. All right, so we're going to talk about that problem. So basically, we can start off with the understanding that recommendations are a part of every, our everyday life, and the quality of those recommendations is really important when we think about our experience. So this, uh, these days, nearly every single organization that you interact with in every aspect of your life is trying to use personalized recommendations to either increase your engagement, perform targeted marketing, increase sales, or improve your experience as a customer. Or in the case of healthcare, try and improve your outcomes or just simply experience as a patient. So while recommendations are everywhere, expectations about the quality of those, recommend uh, those recommendations are also on the rise. Because we as consumers and data scientists are getting smarter and smarter about knowing what data organizations uh, have about us and we expect them to use that data to provide us with a seamless experience. And so when we, when we do have those poor recommendations, they're, they're quite noticeable. And so I have a few examples myself from some of my interactions in the past few months. So recently, I went online, I shopped around, and then ultimately I decided on and, and purchased a pair of new shoes. And then for at least a week or two after that, I, I received targeted ads in all of my social media feeds um, from that same retailer for the exact same pair of shoes, just in a different color. Now, I only have two pair, pairs of feet, I don't, or one pair of feet, two feet, and I am not actually one of those shoe collectors. And so I don't need this many shoes, or ex exactly the same type of shoe at least. And then I also uh, recently moved into a new apartment, and so I needed um, a new lamp. And I purchased one from a different online retailer. And then the next time I visited that site, all of the additional recommended products that were kind of along the bottom of the page um, were sink plumbing parts. So different types of, of sink P-traps, for example. I remember that was one of the things that they recommended to me because I had to look up even what that was. Uh, because I don't own the apartment, and so I'm fortunate enough to not have to worry about replacing those different pieces of plumbing. And so these recommendations were certainly not relevant uh, to me. And this type of mismatch that you might experience between the recommendation that you're receiving and your specific interests tends to give you a good sense of how each of these different organizations are approaching generating their recommendations. When you see very highly similar products, like in the case of multiple 
um, shoes that are just different colors, then they're likely using content-based recommendations. So they're placing the emphasis on the similarity of the recommended items. And this can be really good in certain scenarios because you don't necessarily need to know much about the customer in order to make uh, the next recommendation. But it also makes it really hard to actually recommend those complementary or new items, like maybe socks or other accessories. And then when you see completely different products that aren't necessarily relevant to you, my guess would be that that uh, company is actually using collaborative filtering, where the similarity of the customer's history or of, of interactions with the products to, those, uh, to other customers and their interactions with different products are used to then identify uh, your recommendations. And then, of course, there are a lot of other approaches that I'm not going to go into today. You know, you could have a hybrid approach where you're combining the, the content-based and collaborative filtering, or you can also do things like place a higher emphasis on sale items or select promotions. Um, so maybe the week that I bought a lamp, they were trying to kind of like get rid of some inventory uh, with sync parts. Um, who knows? But today what I'm here uh, and I'm going to focus on talking about is context-aware recommendations. Specifically, I'm going to start off by focusing in on the journey of a specific retailer that we've worked with that had millions of products. And this organization was trying to give customers a better online shopping experience by improving the recommendations that uh, were leveraging interactions with the, the customers and their website. And so this type of data included uh, the search results, as well as uh, they wanted to identify additional products that might be of interest to the shopper. So both kind of improving um, search relevan relevancy as well as the kind of additional you might also be interested in uh, bar along the bottom of the, the, of the page that you often see. So um, the data that they had access to included uh, it, initially, at least, included um, the browser session information, such as those, those search terms that you type in, the clicks, uh, so what products did they actually look at the details of, um, what did they actually add to the shopping cart, and then what did they end up finally purchasing. And before they uh, moved to a graph-based approach, they were starting off with uh, the collaborative filtering. And the reason why they actually initially chose this approach was because they wanted to take advantage of all of the historical data that they had to find those customers that did share in similar behaviors and interactions with their website. And then they could use that to then predict those future purchases as part of their recommendations. And so this would enable them to both surface products that were commonly purchased together and then also find those groups of customers with those similar purchasing habits. And so in this little example we have here, um, if Mingo and Jane both purchased a lamp in the past uh, and then Jane also bought light bulbs, they would be able to then recommend light bulbs to Mingo as an additional product you might be interested in. And this worked uh, fairly well for them at the start. But as their organization grew, they began to run into some issues. And the first challenge that they encountered, I've heard it come up a few times today in different talks and different questions, uh, was the cold start problem. So when they added a new product to their portfolio, uh, like a new high efficiency light bulb instead of just a standard light bulb, um, they didn't have the, that history of past interactions with that product in order to start bootstrapping those first recommendations or even to be able to match it against a likely search term that could then lead to an event eventual purchase. And then when the, they had new shoppers log on, so now we have Fabian who's interacting with their website, um, they had a similar uh, challenge of not having that historical data in order to identify other similar customers. Another challenge that they encountered was having a hard time leveraging all of the data that they actually did have about the customers. So they knew additional things, um, as well as just the, the kind of session browsing uh, behavior. For example, they have had some past interactions with Mingo such that they could have identified him and Aditi as being amateur interior designers. 
uh, whereas they also had some data in another kind of silo that indicated that Jane was a contractor who had multiple large-scale projects that were going on in parallel at any point in time. And so reworking your model to include these type of enriched views that can then help you interpret and uh, generate better personalized recommendations for each of these different profiles of people um, can, be, can be quite challenging using a traditional method. And then finally, the uh, ultimate challenge that they ran into was actually scaling out their solution. So as their, their product uh, portfolio grew into the, the several millions of unique products, they encountered a limited ability to be able to uh, improve that search relevance due to the sparsity and the heterogeneity of their data. Um, so the, and this is kind of a common scenario that we see with online retailers where often your most active customers are actually only interacting with a few hundred of your products at any, any given time. And then the large majority of customers are only purchasing or interacting with a few products each month. So it's very challenging to try and find enough relevant data in order to actually drive your recommendations. So this case study is uh, simply just one example. Um, but these scenarios are very typical of organizations who are struggling and encountering wide and, and very sparse data. So uh, I'll just go over a few of the types of questions that you or your team might be asking that would cause you to kind of bump up into these really common issues of, of having heterogeneous and uh, sparse data. So uh, when you think about all of your, your customers, how can you uh, increase the search relevance when they're interacting with your website? Such that if you have an unusual or a novel search term, as often happens when uh, people are kind of generating typos as they're uh, looking for a particular product or they have find very creative ways of describing what they're looking for because they don't know what it's actually called but they know what they want, how do you provide them with relevant results as well as generate recommendations that are personalized to them as, as a customer. And then how do you know what they actually meant with those creative search terms and then start to capture the intent of the customer so you can help recommend that next, next, next best action or, or next, next best product to purchase. And then for your existing customers, you might also struggle with uh, resolving the customer's identity across uh, multiple different channels. So you might have in-store uh, data about them, you might have those website interactions, and then you might also have anonymous browsing sessions that you want to match up and uh, resolve into the same single identity so that you can provide them with even better relevant suggestions. And all of these different touch points that you have, as well as uh, metadata about those different browsing sessions, the, the, the kind of rich content that you probably have about your pro products, and then the customers, just really increase the heterogeneity of the data. So if we think about our current approaches, you might want to try and leverage as much of that historical data as you possibly can. But since each of the customer's histories tends to be so unique and touching just a, sm a small portion of the portfolio, that just kind of exacerbates the challenge of having the sparse data. And then most machine learning models don't work well when you have such sparse and ha um, high dimensional data sets. And one way that we can uh, go about combating this is to use uh, matrix factorization and other language uh, processing techniques, uh, such as content embeddings, to try and reduce that dimensionality. But this doesn't actually take into account all the context of the data and tends to be best suited for those content-based recommendations, which, again, are not always the most effective for your use case. And then, um, finally, we have that kind of ever-present problem of the cold start. When we have first-time customers, uh, new products that are being added to the portfolio, or those newer infrequent search terms. And when we don't have that historical data on those different entities or, the, or different queries, uh, we tend to use macro-level insights. And these are not going to be very personalized um, and result in, you know, P-trap recommendations. And, 
uh, other kind of irrelevant uh, recommendations that lead to a negative customer experience. So what can we do? Knowledge graphs and graph data science are all about leveraging those existing relationships within your data in order to infer that additional context, that really rich context. And in this world, uh, the data scientists can use those relationships as well as the topological structure of the graph in order to answer questions in addition to your normal tools and tricks. And so the approach is gonna be uh, very similar to your standard workflow. Um, so you're gonna start off by performing some data exploration, you might do some feature engineering, um, and then finally, analytics. And in the case, the, the differ differentiator between your kind of traditional ML approach and graph data science is going to be um, that your focus is on the actual relationships in the data rather than the individual data points in isolation. All right, so now we're talking about graph, and just to anchor us a little bit on um, what a, a graph structure is, it's a representation of data that preserves those relationships and stores them as first-class citizens. So instead of having customer data in one table and the product or vehicle data in another, in this case, there's single data model that uh, has these uh, nodes, we call them, that represent the entities, and then relationships connect those nodes. And what this allows for is queries that can traverse those nodes and relationships uh, to very efficiently capture that entire context of any particular node. And then when you have additional details about those entities or those connections, um, you can store them as properties on those nodes and relationships uh, respectively. So I don't wanna kind of go into too much uh, detail about um, the graph structure today, but the take home point that I um, want you to remember is that this is a very fle flexible data structure and it allows you to surface many different types of information so you can have customer data, product data, uh, product taxonomies, browsing information, all surfaced in the single data model, in a single structure, all represented within context. So this context is very important to, to remember as we return to our um, prior example. So here we have uh, a graph where we can see um, our, our customers, Jane, Aditi, and Mingo, and we also have information about their browsing sessions that are, are highlighted in pink. And I hope it's not too small for a few all to read. Um, then we have a uh, the, their interactions with uh, individual products that are in purple, product information in blue, and then uh, search terms that are related to their browsing sessions in green. And then connecting all of this heterogeneous information, uh, so the connecting the browsing sessions to the products, uh, to the customers, are different relation types. So you can see that, um, for example, Jane and session are connected by has session. Uh, the session ID indicates that Jane purchased the light bulb and, and so forth. So capturing the data in this way makes it really simple to query and traverse the graph and do things like find those similar products that are purchased by, by similar uh, customers. But where the real power of the knowledge graph uh, comes in is when we can then start to infer additional information based on this data. So we're taking the existing data and then enriching it even further. And one way to do this is uh, through the use of graph algorithms and, and graph machine learning. So if we return to each of the challenges that our, our case study uh, customer encountered, now when we start talking about that cold start problem, like adding a new product into the portfolio, we can leverage what little data uh, we had in order to infer those new relationships. So we can use similarity algorithms and node embeddings to identify, identify similar and, and correlated products and then derive those relationships as you can see. And then um, use those derived relationships to, to bootstrap and then improve those uh, recommendations for those new products. So now we can identify that Mingo might not only be interested in the standard light bulb, he might also be interested in the high efficiency light bulb. 
And they can also uh, help surface those new products as results for this existing search term. So the similarity between the a new light bulb and the old light bulb allows us to kind of link that as a uh, potential search, res search result for our, our lighting search term. We can also uh, enhance the recommendations even further by bringing in all of that contextual information that you do have about your customers. So uh, we can start off by running community detection algorithms uh, to capture those links between uh, similar users and then create more accurate communities or customer segments. And then what this allows us to do is identify that Mingo and ADT are actually in the same community of people who are all interested in design and they actually share similar behaviors. And then once we've identified them as similar, we can then leverage each of their histories to improve the recommendations for each other. So now we're kind of uh, creating more appropriate recommendations for Mingo. And I am um, assuming that everybody here uh, knows what an embedding is, but just because uh, node embeddings might be a new concept, I'll kind of uh, go over it quickly. What node embeddings are doing are actually capturing the topology uh, surrounding a node and then transforming it into that two-dimensional vector. Um, then that can be used uh, further with graph algorithms like community detection, uh, the similarity analysis, or, or predictive machine learning. Um, so in this case, uh, what that means for us is if we're trying to find the most uh, similar customers, we can take this heterogeneous data that creates a neighborhood of context around Mingo and ADT, um, reduce that, that kind of high dimensionality, capturing it as a vector. And then what that means is if a DT and Mingo's vectors are in fact close enough to each other within vector space, we also know that they're going to be very similar within the, the network or, or the graph space. So given that we have this ability to reduce the dimensionality and then infer those new relationships and kind of provide new in information um, in our graph, uh, content-driven uh, recommendation systems are able to continue to give you that high-quality recommendation as your data grows and, and changes. Uh, graphs also kind of help as you scale, not only from the uh, kind of uh, sparsity issue, but also our kind of helping from the, the storage perspective as, as when you're thinking about trying to recreate this type of view, if you are using um, more of a tabular approach, um, it's gonna take a million different joins that results in a lot of data replication and redundancy. Um, and so that can be kind of tolerable at smaller scales, but as you're bringing um, more and more data into your organization, it can kind of cause your analyses to, to, to slow to a halt. Um, Finally, uh, customer journeys uh, can be extracted by running uh, graph traversals. So for any given customer, so we've kind of fleshed out this example a little bit more to show more than one um, uh, browsing session for, for Jane. We can start uh, using these simple queries, just tracking her uh, journey and her interaction across these different sessions, and then leverage that in order to uh, generate even more personalized recommendations as well as use that to identify and learn from other similar customer journeys. So if we put it all together, what does our complete solution look like? So first of all, we're gonna start off by capturing those customer interactions in a graph, uh, connecting those browsing sessions to the customers, to the products, to the product taxonomies, et cetera. And then um, all of those different relationship types that we can um, create represent uh, the it's how those past purchases and browsing behavior of the customers are, are connected so we can kind of track their, their journey throughout time. We can also learn customer preferences um, by analyzing that history and then uh, traverse the graph to find similar products that were purchased by similar uh, customers who also have similar preferences or similar customer journeys. And then, um, in the case of very sparse data sets, which is pretty common nowadays, it can also be queried efficiently to kind of collect that representative information, and so uh, enhancing the quality of those recommendations. The next step would be to then add in the graph algorithms on top of your knowledge graph, 
So there we can segment users into communities using community detection and then run similarity analyses within those communities um, using node similarity or node embeddings and then identify uh, most similar customers. We can also do this on uh, the other types within the graph. So we can start to identify pairs of correlated products as well as um, pairs of different types of entities, such as connecting and inferring links uh, between those, those search phrases that customers are kind of always coming up with, and then the uh, most relevant products. And what this allows us to do is, is it helps us identify those similar customers and those similar products, um, and, and ultimately improve the, the search relevance and, and improve the uh, customer experience from multiple different angles. So you can see we're kind of taking um, a multi-pronged uh, approach here, both looking at the kind of search interaction as well as taking advantage of that enriched graph in order to generate these um, kind of additional recommendations that are tailored to each one of the customers. So how do you get started yourself with, with graph data science, either for uh, context-based recommendations or any other use case where um, you have highly connected data? It's not just a library uh, that you can download, I'm sorry to say. Uh, it's gonna be a multi-step approach. The first step is always going to be building out that knowledge graph, and that's because once your data has been connected and represented in a way that can kind of start naturally bubbling up those patterns of relationships, then many times what seems like a, a pretty complex question when you're thinking in the land of tabular data can actually be answered uh, just with simple, simple queries. So kind of the restructuring exercise can often kind of uh, uh, provide you with the answer in itself. And then, um, once we have that, that new data structure, that also enables us to do the next step of, kind of running the more complex um, algorithms and, and opening up the, the world of, of graph machine learning that allows you to go beyond the data that you've, you've collected and again, start inferring those relationships and, and kind of predicting uh, that missing data. And we also have uh, uh, graph embeddings and supervised machine learning that kind of uh, allow you to make any type of predictions about your data in terms of what would your customer's next uh, purchase be, or you can also uh, apply labels to your entities, like is this particular customer a churn risk, um, or do I think that they're fraudulent, for example. Um, so ultimately, graph uh, data structures are preserving those relationships between uh, multiple entities, and graph algorithms and graph machine learning are using those relationships to answer questions. So I've been talking about um, recommendations, but exactly what question you apply uh, graph data science to is, is up to you. Um, and if I can just leave you with one recommendation, um, it would be to uh, start exploring graph data science. So if you're interested in, in learning more, stop by our booth. Uh, we have a workshop at the end of the week that's going to be really cool, uh, going into fraud instead of recommendations. And then there's always a lot of information online, or you can um, ask me questions now or, or email me as well. Uh, so thanks for your attention. Thank you, Katie. We have time for just uh, one or two questions. There's one over here. She's going to bring the mic to you. I love all this conversation about graph. It's great. Hey, Katie. Uh, hi. hi. Thanks for a great session. So uh, I have a like, couple of questions. One is like, are graphs, graph models, complement the existing models we have right now? The traditional models, are, are they going to replace them? Are they superior to the existing models because there is so much context in the graph. Uh, the embeddings generated from the graph models definitely are superior to the ones which we traditionally generate. So my first question is, are they going to replace or they are one more model in, in our machine learning toolkit? The second question is like, this knowledge graph, uh, if I think 
it's more of a feature engineering uh, and uh, generating the embeddings is more like feature extraction. So uh, are, are they like inputs to the machine learning task or any task we have or like they themselves can generate some predictions? Yeah, those, those are great questions. Um, so the first question was, is this going to kind of replace the uh, traditional approach to machine learning, or is it more of a complement? And I think it's absolutely a complement, because there are certainly questions that are better suited towards graph, um, and then others that uh, you can do just as well outside of the graph environment. So I do think of this as an additional way in your pipeline to either, um, first of all, just kind of improve uh, your data storage and ability to query that information, as well as then surface the new graphy features that you might not be able to extract as easily from your data in a more relational sense. And that kind of gets into your second question of, OK, so then is this just all about uh, feature engineering and trying to capture that, that connectivity in an embedding or in some other um, algorithm? And um, the answer is uh, it could be, uh, or can it, you generate predictions? And you can do both. So um, at, at Neo4j, we have a lot of customers who are using this uh, more as a feature engineering opportunity and then piping into uh, you know, neural nets uh, downstream somewhere else, um, uh, perhaps in, in Python. And then uh, we also do have the ability to actually run those uh, predictions in graph as well. So it depends a little bit on the type of, of machine learning model you want to apply. Um, is it classification? Is it um, you know, label propagation or something like that? In that case, it's, it is well suited to the graph environment. Um, but certainly, there are a lot of machine learning models out there that um, are not as easily translated. Uh, so you can. Uh, the answer is both, and it depends for, for your specific case. Very nice. To learn more, please stop by the booth at Neo4j right outside. Thank you, Thank you. so much. <laughs>